I think you did a great job of exposing the lies of t- the toxic empathy used on sometimes both sides to justify killing innocent babies. It's never yeah. loving to kill a baby, full stop. Let's talk about the sexuality issues because I do think there's a ton of emotional hijacking that happens there. Yes. And, you know, I, I'm going to start with one that was really controversial. Um, and I know you address this with reproductive technologies in your book, but when you have these public figures come out and talk about their adoption stories and they're in same sex relationships. And so they're either doing surrogacy and IVF or there's adoption, but often it's surrogacy and IVF to have children. And people who say, well, a child deserves a mother and a father, when at all possible, let them have a, a mother and a father. That's an air, irre- those are irreplaceable roles. It's not that mm-hmm. everyone has them because of loss or death or even mm-hmm. God forbid abuse, but that's maximally good for kids. Mm-hmm. And so when you, you know, especially if you're bringing life into the world intentionally through IVF and surrogacy only to deny that child of a mother or a father because they're being placed with the same sex couple, there is all this empathy for the same sex couple, right? In modern society. Well, of course they should have the right to have children. How dare you? This child is gonna do great. The child's fine. It's not a big deal. You address some of this. What is your take on that? Yeah, there's something uh, called the family diversity theory. And I heard about it first from Dr. Brad Wilcox. He's Mm -hmm part of the Family Institute at the University of Virginia. And it's mm-hmm. this theory that children just need love. And it doesn't matter who it's from. They It could be aunts and uncles. It could be some kind of strange polycule situation. It could be two men. It could be two women. It could be a single parent. As long as they are loved and cared for, as long as they have material resources, mm-hmm. they're not abused, they're not in severe poverty, they'll be fine. But that's not actually what the data bears out at all. The data bears out that a child, even in an imperfect home, Mm -hmm. feels most stable and most secure, most emotionally healthy when they're with their biological mom and dad. And as you said, are there exceptions to that? Of course, we're not advocating for a child to stay in an abusive home. But statistically, this is what is healthiest for the child. And Obviously, that makes sense. The two components that are made to make a child are also needed to raise a child. It's a very anti-science, pseudo-religious, superstitious position to say, you need a sperm and an egg, a man and a woman. Every single person on earth needs that in order to exist. But then one of those components or one of those people all of a sudden becomes replaceable or arbitrary. And here's the thing, because we have people who are part of the LGB that are like, well, I don't agree with the T, but homosexuality and gay so-called marriage is completely different. It's not. It's the same math. Trans women are women is the same math as love is love because you're refusing to define what those things are. It's just a secular mantra that can mean anything you want it to mean. It's just as absurd. And you are saying essentially, just as transgenderism says, Well, basically a woman can be anything that you say, anyone that declares it. Well, the gay union movement or gay marriage movement is saying a mother can be anything that you say that it is. A father can be anything that you say that it is. These aren't real fixed biological categories. These are social categories that we can kind of just change. I think it is one of the cruelest crimes against humanity that we are purposely creating and raising motherless and fatherless children. I mean, there's a reason why in the Bible, fatherlessness is exclusively a category of vulnerability. Christians are called to take up the cause of the fatherless. And yet when it comes to reproductive technology, when it comes to two women raising children, we don't think of that. We don't think of those as vulnerable children that we're supposed to be carrying the mantle for. But I mean, there's a reason why the Bible doesn't really talk about motherless children because it's unnatural. It is so against how God created us. And it's such a historical aberration because mothers very rarely abandon their children. And yet right now we are not only celebrating that in the name of empathy and love, we're subsidizing it through IVF and especially in the state of California. Um, And I think those chickens will come home to roost at some point, and it's frightening to think about what that will look like. It's a massive social experiment that has never been done before in the history of humanity. What politics, a combination of, of politics, we can call it progressive politics, and reproductive technologies has created, where there's a whole generation of kids that are intentionally being separated from their biological parents, not because of loss or abuse, 
because of the choices, yeah, the commodification of the creation of new life. Yep. And there's so little regulation of any of it, of course. Yeah. We, you know, you've talked about this so many times in your show. You've been so amazing about that. Allie talking about reproductive technologies and the harm of IVF. But there's a whole generation of kids that are having a massive social experiment performed on them. Yeah. And they're and they're being told that you do not need a mother or you do not need a father, that you should be happy because you're being gaslit. They're being gaslit. Yes. And Katie Faust, who you've talked about, she has them before us. And she highlights a lot of the testimonies of these kids who are told by their peers, told by their teachers, told by their counselors, their therapists, and their parents, no, you don't really want a mom. No, you know, some people have bad moms. No, you're, aren't you happy? Look at everything that you have. Look at how much they love you. Look at everything they went through to have you in the IVF process. Mm -hmm the egg selling, the womb renting process, which is a whole other horrific side of the surrogacy um, aspect of all of this. And so even children are being told, no, I know you feel like there's something missing. I know you're feeling like you were abandoned and you want to know half of your DNA. Mm -hmm. I know that you long for that love of your mother, but you don't really need it. Um, I don't know if you saw Lance Bass. He was, you know, the in sync singer and he is with a man and they did the whole surrogacy process to have children. And he actually confessed in an article when he was being asked about fatherhood, he said, you know, it was so hard. And the first year of their life, they wouldn't cuddle with us. They never wanted to snuggle with me. And yet when my mom came over, it was immediate. They just gravitated toward her. That's I'm so like, sad. Yes, Allie. because God created us physiologically to need our moms. And, you know, I, I always get asked, well, what about adoption? Are you mm -hmm. saying that that's... Well, I am saying, of course, that adoption is not the ideal, but adoption redeems an already broken situation, whereas surrogacy, egg selling, sperm selling creates mm -hmm. that broken situation. And through toxic empathy, we're only looking at, well, they really want a baby. They really want a baby, whether it's a same-sex couple or like, you know, a heterosexual couple that's using reproductive technology, we never think about the babies on the other side of the equation. We only think about who the media says are the victims, and that's the parents wanting a child. Such a good point. I remember seeing a co comment or a short video, Khloe Kardashian, after yes. undergoing surrogacy, admitting that she didn't feel she could connect with her baby afterwards, like it wasn't her baby. She and didn't even come get her baby. The doctor that delivered the baby said, I'll take the baby home for the weekend because you're busy, you're out of town. I mean, that's commodifying, your objectifying your child in a way. It's like, oh, let me put that dress on hold. I can't get it right now. I'll come get it later. I mean, and those first few moments of that child's life where it's so important to connect, those are gone forever. There is part of the, I think, toxic empathy narrative too is – so many people I think are struggling with their sexuality and there's real struggles happening yeah. and there's real questions that are happening. And some people, they believe they find a sense of community relief and freedom yeah. when they are in what is called today, you know, in our kind of colloquialism, LGBTQ plus IA, whatever community, they feel that they've finally found people that understand them, that affirm them. And I think it is part of the human condition to to some degree wrestle with sexuality or sexual uh, attraction. And this doesn't go away just because you're hetero, you know, in terms yeah. of you're hetero and you might have interest in someone you're not married to, or maybe before you get married, you're sexually attracted to someone. That doesn't mean you should act on those sexual attractions. So the whole the whole rubric for how to think about sexuality has been flipped on its head today. Yeah. And so now, you know, you are your desires, your desires mm -hmm. are a core part of your identity. And if you can't act out in your desires within the reason of, you know, it has to be between consenting adults. That's like kind of the, the bedrock now of any sexual ethics. Yeah. Then if you can't do that, then you are oppressed. You are shamed. You yes. are hurt. So yes. you address some of this in toxic empathy. Yeah. How did you navigate that? Because it's so painful for a lot of people who feel like they yeah. are being erased if yes. they're told by others that...